All right, welcome back to another episode of 10,000 Voices. I am so excited to amplify the voice of another phenomenal entrepreneur. This is Dr. Trisha Richards Service, and she is the CEO and founder of I Need a Speaker. Hi. Hi, Trisha. How are you today? I'm so great. So happy to be with you having this conversation. Thank you. How are you today? I am well. I'm bursting on my insides because we both are dedicated to amplifying voices and to know that we have such an alignment in our messages, different communities that we're serving, but so needed. So I always ask everyone, how did you get started in this work? What is your origin story that that is propelling this, this mission and passion for you? I have taught public presentation for over 20 years. I have been in corporate America and I've also been an adjunct instructor, then later a full-time instructor at different universities. And about four and a half years ago, I was asked to sit on a committee to find a speaker for an event. Mm -hmm. We get into the committee meeting and the meeting rolls on. We get to the part about finding the speaker and we start asking the question, who do you know? Who do you know? a question I have come to detest. And it's the reason is that I would detest it is because no one in our personal networks met the criteria we wanted for the speaker. And we only had $1,000 for the honorarium, which wasn't nearly enough to engage a traditional speakers bureau. So for hours, we just labored over the question of who do we know and who do we know who might be able to help us find a speaker? And it was fruitless. So on the way home from that painful meeting, I decided there's got to be a central place to find a qualified speaker at any price point. There are so many people out there willing to talk and share their expertise and their inspiration on almost all topics. So I drove home, walked in, and I said to my husband, I'm starting a business. And he said, it didn't go well. I said, no, Kevin, it did not go well. So here we are about four years later. And I Need a Speaker now has users in 10 countries and does have qualified speakers at every price point. That is fabulous. So I think this is also an education opportunity. Obviously, I'm a paid keynote speaker, so I understand what it is to fight for my honorarium first as a woman, then as a woman of color, but then also to know that so often the unknown speakers are left out of the conversation. And the fact that you've built this business to get those voices heard, because it's like, do you want to pay $100,000 for X, Y, Z? This person over here could probably deliver even a better message. And they're mm -hmm. five or 6,000. Yes. Yes. And what I'm noticing is that if I could use the analogy, speakers are kind of like a bottle of wine in that it can be really good quality and doesn't have to be expensive. Some of my most impactful, effective speakers are people who have a transformational personal message or who just love what they do and they get the joy out of sharing it. I had met a double PhD at one point who was constantly volunteering to do science tours and talks. And I said to him, you can make a fortune in corporate. What are you doing this for? And he said, it's all about the joy that I see when people realize that I've taught them something. And it's something I've loved since I was a child. It brings me joy. He said, so I'll keep coming back every day. So it doesn't always have to do with the price tag. Right. It doesn't. It really doesn't. But that's human psychology, right? To say, oh, I paid for it. It must be good. And it's like, right. no, not necessarily. <laughs> um, and then please educate our audience as well as to what a speaker bureau is and what some of those standards are, because so often people will say, oh, oh I'll just go get a, a speaker agent or bureau. And I'm like, that's not how it works. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. In the business, a traditional speakers bureau often will have uh, a ceiling and then a floor of what they want to have their speakers charge. Some will be very upfront and say, we don't accept speakers who charge less than $15,000. Some might say, we don't accept speakers who charge less than $25,000. And my research indicates that we're missing the majority of speakers at this point. The majority of people who can wow an audience and share information and inspire and entertain and motivate. Um, so I built this so that we could 
kind of break down those walls a little bit and find that missing population of speakers and give them a chance to get booked, whether it's virtual or in person, give them a chance to share their knowledge, their wisdom, their experience with audiences everywhere. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm so joyed about the work that you're doing. One of my words is always, how can I make this journey more accessible for somebody else? Because I just felt like there were so many hoops and hurdles to entrepreneurship. Um, and so that leads me to my next question. What's one thing about this entrepreneurial journey that you found differs from your perspective for women versus men? Wow. Speaking as an entrepreneur, I will say that maybe uh, we don't see ourselves as entrepreneurs as easily. Mm -hmm. I think we have these labels that we're attached to or that people attach to us. So we have daughter, sister, aunt, mother, cousin. We have employee. We have community volunteer. We might have board member. We might have student. Uh, we might have all these things attached to us. But I think women don't often put themselves first and say, this is what I want for my life. And it might sound selfish to some listeners saying, why would I do that? I've got four kids. How can I put myself first? But the truth is that once the kids are off to school or once you have that little window of time, ask yourself with intention, what do I want my life to look like? Because there will be a time that they go off to work or military or school or wherever they go. And it's still, you've got a lot of years left after that. And that's kind of what I'm experiencing now is that my younger child is in high school now. And I'm thinking this is really a time to do what I truly want to do. And this venture to call it that is one that allows me to use all of my professional and academic expertise and really flex those muscles in a way that could help people. That's fabulous. Um, and for the mompreneurs out there, I am not a mom. I'm an auntiepreneur. And people say, well, why are you doing all of this? And I said, because even though they're not my kids, they're still my kids. I still want to help lay the foundation for them and the kids that they might choose to have. So uh, to your point, I also can't live just off of the feels that they get me when they're five and six. Like they're going <laughs> to, these yeah. 10 years are going to go by and I'm going to need a life after I finish you know, helping them shape into the fine adults that they will be. So right. absolutely. we all need self-fulfillment. We all need that on some level. That's the very tip of Maslow's hierarchy is where we're supposedly aspiring to go. So Ooh. whether we have 10 kids, zero kids, neighborhood kids, or just a dog, I mean, we also have ourselves to think about and what kind of life do we want? And although that could, like I said, sound a little bit selfish, it's also being a role model for everybody you meet. And I'm not thinking just in terms of kids, but in neighbors, students, community volunteers who work alongside you, people who might be in your yoga class or your bowling league or your gardening club, you know, whatever you're involved in. We can be a role model and help other people elevate and self-realize. That is so fabulous. That is... That's everything. Um, what's one thing you would share with a woman who's like, I think I'm ready to be an entrepreneur, ready to step out. What's one piece of advice you would give her about entering this, this venture, this journey? Wow. I would say two things if I could. You said yeah. one, can I make it two? One would be to educate yourself, understand what the risks and benefits are and get the resources lined up. So I would encapsulate that in education. I've got books I could recommend, resources. There's so much online. And the people who work for the small business development centers, the launch boxes, the incubators, those people are fantastic and often will provide advice for free. You just have to walk in and ask for it. So that's one thing is education. And the other would be self-confidence. I learned way too late in life that the only boundaries I have are the ones I create in my own mind. And when I smashed those apart, things started to open up in a way that was mind blowing. It was unlike anything I've ever experienced, just having that faith in yourself and not comparing yourself to other people, but just thinking, I choose to do this. I can do this. Yay. Okay.
okay, two things. I like those two things. And I agree with education. I said, if you do nothing else, educate yourself, not only about the process, but on who you are and who you know you intend to be in service to other people. So yes, tick and tick. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And intentional life and servant leadership. They're beautifully paired. Yeah. What is, do you think, the best investment you made and the worst investment you made thus far in your entrepreneurial journey? The best investment was time and people. Um, time with people, if it's if you want to have one thing. The best thing that I did was go out to my customer base and talk to them and say, what are you doing now? How's that working for you? So to speakers, I would say, what are you looking to do? What are you doing now to try to get booked or to get more bookings? To event planners, I would say, who are you looking for? What are the trends that you're dealing with right now? Where are your pain points and how are those things going for you? And I incorporated that feedback of over 80 people at this point to building a business model that is a win-win for everyone involved. So that customer feedback, also known perhaps as my own market research, is really what was driving me to understand how to serve and solve the problems they were experiencing. Yeah. Nice. How about the worst investment? Like, oh, I can't believe I invested time, money, or energy on this. <laughs> the worst investment. Um, I'm trying to think about that. So many things have been good for me. I think the worst investment was in the very beginning, I had three focus groups that were helping me shape the business. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but I had to figure out what that model looks like. And I do believe in focus groups. I see the value. I love their contributions, but the wrong part of that investment was choosing people who know me personally. And when that happens, see how the look on your face is, everything right it's they believe perhaps that they I, they thought I wanted to hear certain things they said what they thought I wanted to hear and that wasn't helpful or maybe they looked at it from a different lens than someone who was an aspiring speaker or who is struggling to find podcast guests or keynoters or workshop facilitators and deals with that on a daily basis so I really wish that I had done more market research early on and not invested in asking people who I already know and who knew my vision um, about their opinion. I really think they wanted to help, their intentions were good, but I needed that hard lesson in the beginning. Oh my goodness. I wrote a post about that a couple of weeks ago. I said, thank you to the well-intentioned, you're not helping because if someone <laughs> says they want to be an entrepreneur, they don't need the floral. They need to see the pockets of themselves. And when they ask, it really was, I need you to tear me apart right now. I will be okay. I have enough firmness in me that whatever you say, I'm going to hear it with kindness and logic and, and not emotion. And I remember the first person I said, I said, yeah, I'm thinking about green and orange for my brand colors or blue and orange. It was like, oh, that's fabulous. No, it's not. No, it's not fabulous. Nor is it me. <laughs> but well-intentioned. And they were like, I, I want to help Sybil and cheerlead. And that's really not what early stage entrepreneurs need. What they need is a clarity voice. Yes. And you know, the first person who checked me on my brand was a total stranger. Wow. A total stranger that I met at a networking event and very lovingly and not knowing, but for the fact that God knows what you need to hear when he said, I don't know what you're selling, but it is not working. Like those were the words. And I said, thank you. I didn't think it was, but nobody would tell me. You had a beautiful answer because one thing that I've learned along this path and along my academic paths and corporate paths as well, is that you have to truly be open to feedback. And when I was younger, I was not because I wanted things a certain way and high standards and 
I wanted to see things really match my vision when maybe my vision wasn't exactly the right thing. Maybe I was on the right track, but I was missing an audience or I was missing a point and I needed that feedback. We do need each other. And I had to be open to it. And it's one thing to say, yes, I'm open to feedback. But if someone says your colors aren't great and you say, you think you could do better? Well, they're not going to give you feedback anymore because you have now just insulted them. You've now just told them non-verbally or verbally or both. I don't want to hear your feedback. It's painful to me. It hurts me. So it really is a, like a self-exposure kind of process to be an entrepreneur because there will be people who say, I don't like what you're doing. And there will be people who say, it's about time someone did what you're doing. Yeah. And there's a lot in between. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, I've, and so he said that part, and I agreed with him up until one moment. And I tell people always trust your instinct. He said, he said, he said, and then there was one thing he said that I like energetically did not agree with. And I said, I'm going to stop you right there. Like I, I made my line of demarcation with him, but up until that moment, I was like, yep, this is everything that I was feeling and I wasn't sure how to verbalize. And then he said something about leadership styles. I was like, oh, nope, you can't test me on leadership styles. That I do. <laughs> <laughs> All this other stuff, yeah, no. Um, but to have that, that reaction to know that that was a part of my my I am and and how I function naturally, and that was the first time where I could feel my voice coming back because normally I would not have set a boundary so quickly in a mm-hmm. conversation. I would have nodded in agreement. Oh yeah, my leadership style does need work. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I love that self confidence, and I love that you were self aware enough to know what your intention was. I've met a lot of entrepreneurs in classes recently, different meetups and groups. And some of them will say, well, I just want to solve this problem. Well, who are your customers? Well, I'm not really sure. What do you want them to do to benefit? Well, I'm not really sure. So write it down, iterate, iterate, iterate. Keep going back until you think it's ready to be tested. And you've got to be prepared for that process. They will tell you when you talk to your audience, your customers, um, what they want. They will tell you what they need. Mm-hmm. And that was very eye opening for me. And I have to say, along the way, there were so many people whose generosity of time, wisdom, and support were just so uplifting and useful that I felt like I couldn't thank them enough. Like little heroes along the way, lifting up and helping and saying, you know what? Here's something you should think about, or how can I support you? Yeah. And I think that's just so generous. And it's what is the fuel that powers these entrepreneurship engines. Yeah. Yeah. One of my church sisters says, yep, look out for those God winks. She said, real country accent, look out for those God winks. And I'm like, I'm looking. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, next question. What are some resources, like actual resources that you found extremely useful while starting your business? I don't know if it's the CRM or the mail, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I love my provider. I do use MailChimp. I love that provider. Um, I like Stripe quite a bit as a resource. I found them to be very reliable, intuitive dashboards, great processing and customer service. Um, I have an IT team that's local to me that I trust with everything. They did the branding, the website, love that. I also have some books that I keep going back to. There's a variety of them. I can provide a list to you if you want to see those. And then uh, the small business groups that I mentioned before, like the small business development centers, the launch boxes, uh, the chambers of commerce. And that's been very helpful. When I joined our chamber locally, I started going to every single event. And as people would say, well, who are you here with? What are you doing? I instantly got feedback and was able to talk to them and say, what are you looking for? How is this working for you? So those resources really were helpful. And I believe every entrepreneur should have a good attorney and a good accountant because that's so critical, whether it's trademark, contracts, terms and conditions, um, and just your basic accounting functions. That's critical. Oh my goodness. If you cannot 
yourself set up a PNL. If you yourself cannot navigate QuickBooks, you need to hire someone. That needs to be an initial investment in not only your sanity, but the safety of your organization and your own finances. So I could not agree with you more. I meet with so many yeah. women who are like, oh, I'm figuring it out. And then you see that the, you know, the personal yeah. bank account is interwoven with the business bank account. And I'm like, no, you'll yeah. never build business credit. You'll never find stability in the business if you have those two touching each other like no <laughs> they really need to be separated one thing that i did in the very beginning was incorporate to protect my assets that's critical as well and i did not go looking for a marketing person because that's part of my own background professionally but if someone wants to be an entrepreneur who does not have that skill set absolutely i would work with a professional you could find a great pr or marketing professional who works on a fractional level or a per project level and just do what your budget can can tolerate at that point. It will grow over time. But those kinds of team members are gonna be critical. Oh gosh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, last question before we shift gears. Of course, I am a believer in protecting your I am. How do you protect your I am as an entrepreneur because right people are like no that's not what you're like no that's not what I do how do you protect that part of you <laughs> let's see I think it's the communication I know that sounds awfully basic but I'm always talking about mission vision values um operations dedication I'm answering questions so if people have any questions about me or about what I'm doing, what the business is doing, or my team might be doing, we kind of clear that up early on. I know that sounds really basic, but it's effective. I make myself very available to people. Yeah, but so often we forget, or we think we're communicating it and we're not, right? We think we're saying the things and then roll back the reel. It's like, no, you didn't actually say that thing that you thought you said. <laughs> So yeah. yeah, I've rewritten the website twice. So yes, I have. <laughs> and that's okay too. This is tweak and iterate, tweak and iterate. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's all part of the process. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I am so excited to shift gears because a uh, part of this experience, of course, is learning more about your business and seeing how I can help you amplify the mission that you are on. And one of the missions you are on is to elevate everyone and to help support other people's big dreams. So tell me about how the nonprofit that you're looking at developed and who you intend to serve, because I'm, I'm really excited to, to dive in on this. Okay. Okay. I need a speaker allows everyone to join. Anyone can sign up for the directory. The people who are going to get booked are the ones who have a little bit of experience, definitely subject matter expertise. And they're also going to have branding materials, maybe a speaker sheet or a reel. Not everyone has access to those things. So I started thinking if my mission is really to amplify new voices and I've got a join for free mentality here and I'm telling people what they need to do, how can I take those tools to the people who are in the pipeline of tomorrow's voices. So one thing that I planned and really considered deeply is how can I reach out to people who are interested, curious, deserving, um, you know, really want to get involved with their own confidence through finding their voice. So that might mean high school students who are starting to prepare for the next stage of life whether it's employment, military, trade school, college. It might be women who have left abusive relationships and are entering the workforce again, or people who are in the ESL community and might not have that confidence when they're building a career or looking for a job or opportunity to speak with confidence. So I am on a mission to do some outreach work where I need a speaker where I can get engaged with these populations and help them develop that confidence, that executive presence 
and that ability to speak, whether it's interpersonally or small groups or eventually larger groups. And they're gonna to be tomorrow's educators, entertainers, um, motivational speakers. They're gonna to be tomorrow's voices. I'm so excited. I said, there's a reason why we met. I'm so excited. So this requires then funding because this will be a nonprofit part of your arm of the business, right? Right. Um, have you heard of Alice.com? I have, I've gotten those emails. They have so much funding specifically for women. Sometimes they're grants. Sometimes it's um, other sources of funding as well. They mm -hmm. always have competitions running and they have very specific categories where you can apply to for like this very specific thing or this very specific need for your mm -hmm. business. I even saw them have like something for a car one time. I'm like, okay, well, I don't need a vehicle, but... <laughs> Like, so oh. definitely uh, one of the ladies in my network here got $10,000 for her child care facility through Alice. I need to read those emails <laughs> more carefully. That's a great resource. Thank you for sharing that. Read those emails. Um, and then grantsforwomen.org. Have you heard of grantsforwomen.org? I have not, but I'm going to write that down as we speak. And I'll be on that website today, as you know, grantsforwomen.org. So what Grants is your knowledge of that? Can you tell me more about it? So they they are like a, a feeder hub for Grants for Women entrepreneurs. Um, there's a lady that I follow on social media, actually. And when, when her name comes to me, I'm going to give her your name. But every week, she will post two or three resources with deadlines or two or three websites where she has successfully helped women get funding for their operations. And that was one of the ones that she talked about um, a couple of weeks ago when, when we first spoke. And I was like, I wonder if this is the, <laughs> so, yeah. And um, they partnered with like Entrepreneur Magazine. So again, one of the ones I would definitely recommend checking out. But when I find this lady's name, I follow, like I said, I follow her on, um, Instagram and she will literally say like this funder has this much apply by or this new website just came up for it you know technology or whatever and the work she is doing is phenomenal because she wants us to get the funding <laughs> thank you for that yes 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 I know one of the challenges you said though is you did outreach to your local community. Tell me more about what happened there. I worked with another a partner to create a program for high school students of any age that could be first year through fourth year high school. And we developed a five hour program that we intended to run on a Saturday. It's designed for a Saturday, it's five hours. We wanted to start at 10 a.m. because the feedback from our market research said, there's no way I'm getting up at that hour. That's what high school kids said. So they don't wanna get up at eight or nine but they'll be there by 10 on a Saturday. So two hours on executive presence, a box lunch with bottled water, and then two hours on public presentation. So they combine all those skills. And by the end of the day, should be able to speak more confidently and have that presence, you know, where they're feeling like they believe in themselves. So what I did was I printed a bunch of brochures and I also did some electronic outreach. I contacted the car dealerships, the attorneys, the orthodontists and dentists, family practitioners, um, who else? You know, the, the bigger businesses in our area, grocery store chains, anyone who would have a dealing with a high school age student, like photographers for senior pictures or with their families and probably put about 400, $500 into that outreach and didn't get a dime back at all, like no one contributed. And I thought that was really surprising because a lot of people want to support a multi-school district program. This was open to anyone in the region um, covering two counties, anyone could come. So we were cutting it off at 200 students because of space restrictions, but still that's a great amount of students. And I also thought for some of these businesses like the grocery stores, they might want to recruit from there. And I said, you can come and recruit. If you give us this sponsorship, 
we're happy to have someone from your organization come and give remarks in the beginning and still crickets. So I was did very surprised by that. Did you do like in kind ask for the grocery stores, that sort of thing? Like if you can't donate money, will you donate food in kind to, to do the box lunches? Was that a part of the proposal? We wanted a box lunch that was ready to roll. And most of the grocery stores don't offer those. So we were looking for a cash contribution so that we could just hire a vendor to deliver them. We didn't have the space to store. We didn't have refrigeration. So those things came into consideration. So it's a great program. And I'm really eager to offer it because I know the value that it would bring to these students. Yeah. And again, if, if we even chose a different population, like, ESL or women re-entering the workforce just to give them that additional push. I would like to see this happen and, yeah. uh, and benefit people who need it. Absolutely. When you visited, because I know you're all about market research. So now I'm doing my little mini dig deep. When you visited the schools, did they already have pre-existing partnerships with any of the list of the businesses that you reached out to? They did. I was thinking about who already has contracts with the school districts because I thought that would be an additional connection. Yeah. And um, I just, I don't know what the rationale is. I know that it's really difficult in the fundraising world right now to generate funds. I saw in the Chronicle of Philanthropy that giving is down, which is concerning because the need, I would guess, is higher. So I'm looking for alternative ways to finance the program and hopefully offer it to students either on scholarship or free or just for a nominal, nominal fee. I found that if there's a nominal fee for a program, people are more likely to attend. Agreed. Yeah. Um, have you tried the local credit unions or the local banks? All of our local banks here do offer smaller it won't be you know the ten thousand dollar but they will do like a one thousand especially if they know that these are their future bankers and they right, like, yeah. they're, their future, they're gonna open up a checking account that day um and so i developed a partnership with one of our local credit unions and got some funding for a conference that i want to hold for women mm -hmm. i'm curious did you tap into those resources i mailed them material but after i'm listening to you talking and I'm thinking about the fact that I didn't specify these are your future accounts. Maybe I should go down in person for the next one and tell the manager um, that she should consider uh, some kind of a sponsorship level because they could literally sign people up right there if they wanted to, right there. That's literally what I did. I said, I went down to the local bank. I opened up my checking account and she said, why did you choose us? And I said, these are the reasons why I chose you all over the other banking systems and over a major banking system. Mm -hmm. And I said, these are the women I support. And by the end of the conversation, she said, when you're ready to host your conference, we want to be a sponsor because you are our target clientele, the woman, the entrepreneur, this much capital. Like it was a conversation that, I would not have otherwise had, but for the fact that I was like, I was going to go open up my bank account and then I left with a sponsor. For my <laughs> All right. I'm just picking you up on the way. <laughs> like, Come on. Thanks. Let's I'll go. swing by, beep the horn. Come on out. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely would work on that sort of um, positioning to say like, this is very specifically your audience and here is why. Um, and then narrow it down. That's excellent. That's excellent. I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Glad to help. And if things turn on me, I'm going to send it in my follow-up email. <laughs> um, so last part, because this has been such a joyous occasion. Um, how can people learn more about I Need a Speaker? And you already know, I think every woman should add speaking to her, her portfolio, but how can they work with you? How can they learn more? Thank you for asking. People can visit our website, ineedaspeaker.com. Follow us on LinkedIn. That's our primary social media. And if you are a speaker or someone who books a speaker, join the growing global user community. Just go into the website and either click on I am a speaker or I need a speaker. 
And once you're in, you can search the directory, you can get booked. We are upgrading the site right now to add great new features where you can literally book a speaker and pay right through the website. And secondly, you'll be able to leave a five-star rating for each other. So speakers and event planners can rate one another so they can book or be booked very confidently. So I love that aspect of it. To my knowledge, could be wrong, but to my knowledge, it's the only rating system of its kind in the entire public speaking industry. So I'm trying to make this respectful, dignified, appropriate, and fair on both sides. It's a big, a big ask. As a public speaker, I would love to read some of the event planners that I've worked with. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, because I think not to you know, downplay the experience. Event planners work extremely hard. I know they've got a lot of competing priorities and the speaker is one of the many things on their list. But I think it's so important to know that speakers do speak and we speak to each other. And if one of us has a not so desirable experience, I'm not going to let another sister speaker, you mm -hmm. know? So I think event planners need to understand like we are also your advocates for your next speaker. And we want to position you for success even after we've left your stage. I want to be able to recommend that this business or this entity treated me well. And I'm so excited to tell you three more people who might align with your mission based off of my experience. So yeah, I think it's important feedback goes both ways. I love that you said that. There is definitely a customer service element here because I'm so impressed with the event planners who lay out the expectations clearly and early. The ones who tell you to hold a date and then stay true to their word. They don't ghost after they say release the date, for example. Um, they tell you exactly what's expected. And I like it when the speakers also adhere to those guidelines and expectations. And by all means, pay your speakers, pay them on time, appreciate them. And that appreciation goes both ways. We know that we both have a job to do and we have audiences counting on us to do our jobs well and give them a memorable and impactful experience. And that's ultimately what I want to see happen through INeedaSpeaker.com at any price point. Thank you so much. Cheap plug for paying your speakers and pair them fairly. I saw a new report that said women are still undercompensated by about 20% to men. And so I'm like, nope, we got to, it's being exposed. Now's the time to stand up and do the right thing for everyone in the industry. Absolutely. Thank okay. you for all the work that you're doing. This was another episode of 10,000 Voices. Thank you so, so very much. I need a speaker.com. There's not much an easier website than that. Stay tuned. See you all on the other side. Till next time, lead boldly, go spread some joy, and remember to become unstoppable. Bye.